This video is on the connection between alcohol and happiness. <clears throat> now, of course, alcohol is pretty common in our society, and I've seen estimates that roughly in developed countries, at least like the US with people of drinking age, probably at least 80% of the adult population consumes alcohol fairly regularly. So I thought it'd be a good idea to do a quick video on the kind of the science and even a little bit of the neuroscience behind how al alcohol affects our mental health and well-being. So if you are hoping that this video I'll talk about the benefits of, for instance, having one glass of wine per day or the occasional drink, uh, I have some bad news <laughs> that that does not seem to be the general direction of a lot of the literature that I've reviewed in preparing this video. So I want to start by explaining, uh, or I should say re-explaining, because there was a very helpful uh, analysis or description given by Dr. Andrew Huberman, a neuroscientist at Stanford University, where he explained kind of in the moment how the brain responds to alcohol and kind of the psychological processing involved and how that relates to happiness. And then I'll survey a few of the studies I looked at that are a bit more of a long-term picture of the effects of alcohol. So let's start this, because this explanation was really interesting at the beginning. So you start with having some level of alcohol, you consume some alcohol. And this leads to in nearly all people, there are a few people who don't have a certain enzyme, enzyme that helps to metabolize alcohol. So those are the type of people that are gonna say like, oh, I have one drink and I just feel kind of, ugh, it just doesn't sit with me the small subset of people, the majority, what we see is actually a sharp spike in two neurochemicals, neurotransmitters called dopamine and serotonin. And now these tend to be associated serotonin, particularly with kind of joy and elevated mood, whereas dopamine is kind of like energy and engagement. And so when you see this kind of sharp spike, generally we feel some level of euphoria. And I think that's common, right? You have a, that first sip of beer or first glass of wine, and it may not be this crazy thing, especially if you developed a tolerance, which we'll talk about, but you feel kind of like, oh, man, this is kind of nice. And that's common in, in mam all mammals. <laughs> but what happens next is you have this, um, there's this kind of the homeostasis mechanism of the brain that try to keep everything in balance and regulated. And what happens is you have this big spike and it leads to a slow reduction in kind of a rebound in these same brain chemicals, which leaves you to kind of this sub-average mood. So you can imagine if you just have this kind of baseline neurochemical state with kind of like moderate mood, and maybe you're just going along at a normal level like this, well, what happens is you get this big spike, but then you have a rebound. So if this pen is the sort of neutral line, you get this big spike, and then immediately after you start to come down and you have this slower refractory or rebounding period. And now that is part of the reason we get hangovers, but it's also part of the reason why people tend to consume multiple alcoholic beverages. It's, it's quite often that people don't just have one or two. Uh, they may begin an evening with one or two, but then every maybe hour or so they have end up having four or five drinks over the course of the night because they're trying to kind of get back up above that baseline during that recovery period of those neurochemicals. Now, what was interesting in this explanation is that with tolerance, so as you increase your alcohol tolerance, which will happen if you consume it at all regularly, this kind of extension of being below baseline actually gets longer and a bit more robust. And at the same time, the feel good part diminishes. So you can imagine at first it was this big spike and then kind of this little lower and then you come back. I think this is quite tra tragic that the spike gets a little lower, but the, the kind of negative crashing part is a little bit more intense and a little bit more drawn out. And you may actually find a similar example here if you're someone who's ever uh, ingest nicotine, smoke cigarettes, a jewel, a vape or something like that first hit, you feel amazing. And then if you do it all day, the hits don't really have that same effect and you just kind of feel a little weird. Well, it turns out some of the neuropsychology behind tolerance, uh, this is how that works, is you kind of get, as you build up a tolerance to this chemical, you get less and less of the good kind of pleasure in that dopaminergic and serotonin release and you get more and more of the kind of refractory rebound pain period. And so what can tend to happen tragically in some cases is that you wanna drink more and more to get that feeling back. 
So I'm gonna pause there because <clears throat> I think it's really interesting to think about then here. We haven't even gotten into the longer term effects of alcohol, which I think we know generally that if you're drinking chronically and quite a lot, uh, for a long period of time, it's quite bad. But I just found this analysis so interesting because it's saying even in that moment, what's going on neurologically is that, again, all of this is grounded in the neurochemicals at work here and how they respond to this, this chemical is you're getting the spike and then kind of a below baseline rebounding effect. And again, that occurs just even with one drink. So what we see there is that it's probably likely that maybe one or two drinks occasionally is not the end of the world because again, you're kind of keeping your tolerance low where you get that nice peak and then a little recovery. But as you build up a tolerance over the course of a week or of course over a longer period, what was a nice peak and then a kind of a low sort recovery becomes an even smaller peak. So you just can't quite get that feeling back and a longer and more painful drawn out recovery process. And so you can also start to see this, I think, in just practical experience. If you think about the type of person who is maybe a 20 something year old who doesn't drink that much and they have a couple drinks and they're like really fun and goofy and then maybe the next day they're a little hungover, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas someone who is a very like chronic, maybe 50 year old alcoholic, they seem to just drink and drink and it's almost like they're trying to do it just to feel normal and they're sort of miserable as they do it. And then they're always feeling like shit. And so you can contrast, well, that's that tolerance effect. So even in the moment we see, this is how uh, alcohol is affecting our kind of happiness and our psychological state. We have that peak in the trough. Now let's get into some of the literature I've seen on how it impacts us in some other ways. So there's, two more kind of immediate impacts, and then we'll get into some of the bigger studies. So two other potentially problematic impacts of alcohol on mechanisms that support happiness, not talking here so much about the, the, the neuroscience, so to speak, or the happiness state directly, but mechanisms that support it, relate to our stress and our nervous system particularly, and our gut microbiome. So I won't go too far into the literature here, but it's been shown that there's something called the HPA axis, which is kind of this uh, switchboard that connects a lot of our psychology to our physiology. And that is the axis that processes stress. So you can imagine cognitively right now, if I think about all of these emails I have to get to, or maybe there's one that I forgot that was really important, it creates an immediate physiological change in my body. My shoulders kind of tighten, my breathing elevates, my heart rate increases. So this axis kind of connects those two. And we see that uh, regular consumption of alcohol tends to affect the HPA axis in a way that makes us uh, experience higher levels of stress when we are not drinking. So it's kind of this uh, almost like an anti-antidepressant <laughs> or an anti-anti-anxiety medication, meaning that it's a chemical that we ingest that's increasing our stress uh, instead of reducing it. And at the same time, we see negative impacts of alcohol on the gut microbiome, which has been shown to be absolutely critical. Uh, it's sort of an emerging area of science at this point, but it's been shown to be absolutely critical for the functioning of our overall health and well-being. So you have two other mechanisms through which alcohol has been shown to be fairly detrimental to our health and happiness. And finally, I tried to kind of zoom out and get some big picture studies. And I often look to things called meta studies, which are studies of studies where they look at uh, multiple different things, or at the very least, uh, these larger sample studies. Uh, one that I found that was a lot of these, well, maybe say, unfortunately, I think it's a good thing to study. A lot of them are looking more at just health, which is important, but saying, well, what are the effects of alcohol on long-term health and longevity and all cause mortality, which basically means how likely you are to die at any given moment. I didn't find quite as many directly looking at happiness and well-being, but there is one from the UK that looked at mental health and they looked at an, an adult population. They found that there is a clear association between poor mental health or poor mental well-being and harmful drinking. So furthermore, what was really important, I thought interesting about this study is that the motivation to drink was a very significant predictor of well-being, specifically uh, coping as a motivation. So saying that I want to drink not because, I don't know, I really love, I'm like a wine person and I love this wine or this craft beer, or, oh, I wanna get together with some of my friends and we're gonna have a few drinks. But rather when it was saying like, I need to drink something to just deal with this stress or cope with an emotion, that was very, very highly associated with lower mental well-being. And conversely, uh, 
excuse me, uh, mental well-being in general, right, is linked with uh, drinking and that uh, worse mental well-being, more harmful drinking. But importantly, the motivation was an even bigger predictor. So across the board, what we see is that uh, generally, now again, this is a, the type of study where you're not doing a, an experiment, so you can't necessarily say exactly if it is causation or just correlation, but generally lower mental well-being and uh, more drinking and particularly more harmful drinking in this case uh, kind of go together and people who use drinking as a way to just cope and deal with stress way more likely to have issues with well-being and so important to point out here too again that this was uh, 6,000 some sample size so fairly robust uh, fairly well done study and I would say that uh, generally most of the other literature points to similar effects that more frequent alcohol use is associated with negative outcomes. Now, what I will point out is that there tends to be uh, some, I at least haven't found any complete consensus on just low and moderate. So maybe uh, two to three drinks per week, or maybe four to five drinks per week, even some of that seem to be uh, like, it's maybe not beneficial, but maybe not terrible either. I think jury's still out there. But generally, what we can say is that the, the arrow of the scientific consensus points towards less is more. So less drinking is going to be better when it comes to alcohol. And then finally, I do want to touch on, this is uh, not so much a study, but a uh, mental health report from the CDC, actually, a fact sheet that says, those who drink more heavily are at increased risk for adverse alcohol-related complications, especially over long periods of time. So uh, you have heart, liver, digestion, cancer, immune system problems, as well as directly tied to mood and mental health disturbances and sleep disturbances. And it's often co-occurring with other mental health problems such as depression and anxiety. And that one squares. You can't really show me. Yeah, I've never seen an alcoholic who's not also depressed or dealing with anxiety disorder. So again, what we summarize there is we know that there's a pretty clear consensus generally that uh, more alcohol or frequent alcohol over any duration, uh, when, when especially if it crosses into a threshold of sort of chronic or harmful drinking, is very clearly shown to be detrimental to our happiness. Very kind of low to moderate, maybe a little bit more of a gray area, but like I said, when we talked less about the studies and more about the neurological mechanisms at work, what we see is there's some problems because drinking taxes our HPA axis and it makes us more stressed overall. Sort of like I use the analogy of an anti-antidepressant or maybe a better example would be an anti-anti-anxiety medication because it's we're taking a substance that's making us have more stress and anxiety later. Also detrimental effects on the gut microbiome, which are directly connected to our cognitive function and mood. And finally, we had that kind of problematic development of how it works on a psychological level where you get this kind of blip in the spike of dopamine and serotonin, which causes a corresponding refractory period, which the more we drink, the lower the, the, the happiness or the joy becomes and the worse and more prolonged the sort of suffering and recovery comes. So overall, I think there's some pretty compelling neuroscience as well as uh, epidemiology and psychology so suggests that alcohol is not a great recipe for happiness nor for health. So I hope this video uh, was was interesting and in getting some of the the why behind we should or shouldn't manage these certain chemicals. I'm certainly not here to tell you you should never drink or you know, how much exactly to drink, etc. But it's worth examining some of the literature here and uh, some of the mechanisms that kind of connect the dots between alcohol and happiness. So. Hope this video was helpful. As always, you can find practical tools from both the art and science of happiness to help you be at your best and work in life. Uh, here's a video that YouTube suggests you'll like from my channel. And that's all for now. I'll see you next time. This has been Jackson Kurchis. Thanks for watching.